Are first round tight ends cursed? Welcome to That's Good Sports here on YouTube. I'm Brandon. If you stack two of me on top of each other, I might just pass as an NFL tight end perna. Now, nine tight ends have been drafted in the first round over the last decade. And as Shio Kapadia of The Ringer points out in this tweet, none of them have made an all pro team and only one of them has notched a thousand yard season. Only David Njoku got a second contract from his original team so far, while we await the fate of Kyle Pitts and Dalton Kincaid. Now, I thought this was a really good observation about the position, but what I want to dig into a little further and answer is a very simple question. Are first round tight ends cursed? Cursed. Now scouts and GMs are eagerly awaiting my research on this topic as someone prepares to take Georgia tight end Brock Bowers, or just took him if you're watching this after the draft, in the top half of the first round. After doing my Aaron Rodgers, sorry, my own research, I've been reminded about how complicated drafting elite tight ends really is. I created this series, Balls Deep, for this exact moment. Because today, we go balls deep in the tight ends. I mean, I love balls. I'm the pube guy. I'm the pube guy. Today's episode is sponsored by manscaped.com slash good sports. And Manscaped has the holy trinity of pube mowers. The Lawnmower 3.0 Plus, the 4.0 Pro, and the 5.0 Ultra. It's like a Pro Bowler, an All Pro, and a Hall of Famer. What's the difference between the three? Well, they each have a different price point and they all get the job done. Each version of the lawnmower has chopped my dirty downstairs lettuce, trimmed my crazy cabbage. Now the 3.0 is sturdy with a nice weight that gives you great control while, you know, in that sensitive area. The 4.0 showcased the multifunction on and off switch that allows you to put the trimmer in travel mode so it doesn't start buzzing in your luggage. It's also wireless charging compatible. And my favorite is the 5.0 and not just because it's the newest. The swappable heads make it the most dynamic in my humble pube guy opinion. I believe the trimmer blade is longer and it cuts as good as any trimmer Manscaped has ever produced. But the game changer for this guy for me was the foil blade that you can swap out for a near bare shave. So pick the trimmer that works for you and use my link below manscaped.com slash good sports to get 20% off plus free shipping. Pubes. Let's go back to the first round of the 2014 draft, the year of Blake Bortles, Odell Beckham, and Sir Jonathan Football. North Carolina tight end Eric Ebron went off the board at 10th overall to the Detroit Lions, who were coming off a playoff season and wanted to get Matthew Stafford a second playmaker next to Megatron. Ebron was solid, but not great in the Motor City, averaging 517 yards per season in four years and a total of 11 TDs. The Lions even originally exercised his fifth year option, but released him in March before free agency in 2018. Now, Ebron landed in Indianapolis, where he immediately broke out in his first season with the Colts, catching 66 passes for 750 yards and 13 touchdowns from Andrew Luck. It worked out for the Colts, who signed him for just six and a half million uh, a year, but certainly not for Detroit because the next three picks after Ebron were Taylor Lewan, OBJ, and this one really hurts Aaron Donald. While any of those three guys would have been a better option, Ebron was far and away the best tight end in the 2014 class. And in an odd twist of fate, Matthew Stafford ended up playing with Aaron Donald and Odell Beckham Jr. anyway in Los Angeles. Now the interesting thing here is Eric Ebron played for two very good quarterbacks and yielded different production. As much as you need a tight end to be a physical freak, possessing the ability to block and run routes and catch, those traits have to mesh with the offensive scheme and the quarterback. And unlike wide receiver ones, a tight end's use can vary drastically even 
with a great passer. Now, smartly, the next two drafts featured zero tight ends coming off the board in the first round. Uh, the best of the bunch in 2015 was fifth rounder C.J. Uzama. In 2016, Hunter Henry was the first tight end to go off the board in round two, followed by Austin Hooper, and fittingly became the first and second most productive tight ends in that class. A year later in 2017, O.J. Howard became the 19th overall pick by the Bucks, but the juice was most assuredly not worth the squeeze for five years in Tampa. Howard wasn't exactly a total bust, averaging 350 yards and hauling in 15 touchdowns over five years with Tampa. A killer, this OJ was not. And he ended up getting outperformed by five other tight ends in that class, two of which were drafted later in the first round, Evan Ingram and David Njoku. Now, Ingram really hit the ground running after moving on from New York to Jacksonville, catching 114 passes for 963 yards last year with the Jags. He's also a special case, playing more of a wide receiver hybrid role than a true tight end. As for Njoku, he took seven years, a kitchen accident that caused severe burns to his face and a cameo from Joe Flacco before becoming a true star in Cleveland. He was basically a role player in that offense from 2017 to 2022, which wouldn't have hurt so much if the player taken one pick later wasn't TJ Watt. Watt falling all the way to pick 30 has to be one of the dumbest things in any draft ever. Of course, the star of that 2017 class was fifth round tight end, a guy out of Iowa by the name of George Kittle, taking one pick after the Broncos selected tight end Jake Butt, who tore everything but his glutes in Denver. Now, I think Kittle really exemplifies why tight ends can be so difficult to evaluate because he didn't even have a thousand yards total in college. He developed late, hitting puberty at 22 and morphing into the Adonis we know him as today. He was also hidden in a fairly conservative Iowa offense while he shared the field with a couple other really good tight ends, deflating his numbers. But he got to San Francisco in the perfect offense, and by year two, he led the league among tight ends with 1,377 yards. Not to mention, he's a fucking Abrams tank as a run blocker. One of the biggest reasons San Francisco has been dominant on the ground since Kyle Shanahan was hired the same year they took Kittle. Go figure. Just one tight end heard his name called in the first round in 2018, Hayden Hurst, who was a 25-year-old rookie for Baltimore. When they say X amount of teams passed on Lamar Jackson, that includes the Ravens because they took Hayden Hurst seven picks before they took the future two-time MVP. That was interesting for another reason. The Ravens were drafting Hurst to essentially replace their second round tight end, Max Williams, who they selected in 2015, who hadn't emerged as the receiving threat they had hoped. Hurst is still in the league and joined the Chargers this offseason, but his peak came in year three, his first year with the Falcons when he had 571 yards and six touchdowns after being traded for picks. Hurst had nice chemistry with QB Matt Ryan, but that was the season Atlanta fired Dan Quinn midseason, and everything was pretty much a disaster there for the Falcons, meaning Hurst played his best football while surrounded by complete chaos. Ironically, or perhaps not so ironically, if you subscribe to the thesis of this video, Baltimore actually ended up with a star tight end at 86th overall when they selected Mark Andrews out of Oklahoma that same draft. Andrews has three Pro Bowls, a first-team All-Pro, and a 1,300-yard season under his belt in his first six years. I think the Ravens learned their lesson, and seeing Andrews' success is probably a big reason they took Isaiah Likely in the fourth round in 2022 and reaped the benefits when Likely filled in for Andrews last year for injury, catching six TDs in his absence. Going back to 2019, that year was a strange one for tight ends. Two tight ends went off the board in the top 20 picks, both from Iowa, TJ Hawkinson and Noah Fant. Now you'd be very silly to call Hawkinson a miss just because he's no longer on the Lions. He's had 1,800 yards in the last two years combined 
and still, he's not the best Iowa tight end in the league. Oh, hey there. Neither is Fant, who was actually a lot better, or perhaps used more in Denver before he became a part of the infamous Russell Wilson trade package in the 2022 offseason. Still, with fewer than 3,000 yards to his name and just 14 touchdowns over five seasons, I'm sure Denver would have wanted a do-over on the 20th overall pick. Now, you'd probably argue that the Bills got the best tight end value in the third round that year when they selected Dawson Knox, who hasn't racked up huge receiving numbers, but has been a force in the run game. Remember, half of the job of a tight end is to block. The Noah Fant pick at 20 doesn't look as bad as some of the previously mentioned tight ends because the picks that followed Fant were all used on mostly average players outside of, say, Montez Sweat at 26. Now, Kyle Pitts became the highest tight end ever drafted in 2021, going fourth overall to the Falcons. Pitts, though, is a tricky case, isn't he? To say the least, he was a freak athlete coming out of Florida who Lance Zerline of NFL.com said creates mismatches similar to those created by Calvin Johnson and Tyree Kill. If you're drafted ahead of Jamar Chase and Jalen Waddle, you better be some sort of combination of Megatron and Cheetah. Mega cheat, Cheetatron. And Pitts came right out of the gate with a thousand yards as a rookie. The first rookie tight end since one Mike Ditka in 1961 to pass the thousand yard mark. But even that thousand yards is a mixed bag because only one touchdown accompanied all of those receiving yards. In his last two years, Pitts has played 27 games and averaged just over 500 yards. The lack of touchdowns are obviously baffling catching just two a season since he was drafted. The question though is how much of the underwhelming production goes back to head coach Arthur Smith's scheme and the diminishing talent at QB since Matt Ryan played his last year in Atlanta. I don't know what tight end is thriving in the NFL with a lethal combo of Marcus Mariota, Taylor Heineke, and Desmond Ritter throwing them the ball. I love balls. That said, tight end Johnu Smith had nearly identical stats to Pitts in 2023 in Atlanta. The question then becomes, was Smith robbing Pitts of opportunity, or is the difference between a good tight end and a great tight end slim? Smith was a third round pick, by the way, in 2017. Now, I'm not ready to render a final verdict on Kyle Pitts, but that's because I'm a fair judge, a very fair judge. Until Pitts gets a season with Big Kirko Cousins throwing him the ball. But Pitts uh, would have to do a lot to justify the fourth overall pick at this point in his career. And you can definitely wonder if they had been better off waiting and taking Pat Fryermuth, who lasted until pick 55 when the Steelers scooped him up out of Penn State. Now, I mentioned uh, Chase and Waddle, but also imagine the Atlanta Falcons with any number of the players taken after Pitts. Payne Sewell, Micah Parsons, Patrick Sertan, and of course, McCorkle Jones. Okay, maybe not that last one. In the post Kyle Pitts NFL, I think scouts might have gotten a little bit scared of the tight end position and its volatile nature. No first rounders went in 2022, then Dalton Kincaid fell to pick 25 and became a pretty essential part of the Bills offense down the stretch last year with 673 yards as a rookie. In a vacuum, that's a pretty good pick, right? But it's not quite the same when you scroll down just a bit further and see the name Sam Laporta at pick 34. Laporta might have been the best rookie tight end ever, and it feels like people barely noticed 10 TDs like Gronk in 2010, but also 300 more receiving yards than Gronk, and a strong blocker in the run game, which is so essential to Detroit's offense. And not to forget, Gronk was also a tremendous blocker. Uh, that rhymes with porn. Like Kittle, Hawkinson, and Fant, Laporta is an Iowa product. It's the one thing they do very well. He caught just five touchdowns in college, so he doubled that number in year one in the NFL. Impressive. Detroit deciding, though, to not pay TJ Hawkinson, who actually fit the bill in terms of where he was drafted, to then find a replacement who may be even better than TJ is one of the most savvy moves you'll find. I want to go back to one of the original points made by Kapadia in his tweet that sparked the idea for this entire video. None of the first round tight ends in the last 10 years uh, have made an AP All-Pro team. That is true, but there's only one All-Pro slot at tight end per conference. Unlike wide receiver where there are three, 
first team all pros. So the bar is automatically higher. You're either a top two tight end in the league or you're not an all pro. The all pro teams have been essentially monopolized by three guys the last 10 years, Rob Gronkowski, Travis Kelsey, and George Kittle. And of course, none of them were first rounders. Gronk was a second rounder, Kelsey a third, and Kittle, as I mentioned earlier, was a fifth round pick. Hell, Aaron Hernandez was also drafted by the Patriots in 2010 with Gronk, which just goes to show how volatile success is at that position. Imagine drafting Gronk and thinking, you know what, let's get the worst insurance policy on earth and future murderer Aaron Hernandez. Ah. Is that how you feel when you wake up in the morning? Ah. <laughs> the other two guys that have snuck in the AP convo are Mark Andrews and rookie Sam Laporta, both day two picks. It's as hard to make the all pro team as a tight end as it is as a quarterback. But I don't think any less of players like Joe Burrow or Matt Stafford because they haven't been honored as a top two player at their position at any point in their careers. But having gone through the last decade of tight ends in the draft, it's still glaringly obvious that there's not a positive correlation between draft position and overall tight end production. The draft is a crapshoot, obviously, but at no position is that more true than, say, tight end. Maybe running back, quarterback, but those are different stories for another day. The question is, why do scouts and GMs keep Fucking it up! Is it cause they're dumb? Are they that dumb? No, they're not. It's it's just, it's tough. First, you have to note that it takes tight ends a lot longer to figure it out in the NFL than most other positions. You can be an excellent receiver at tight end and still not get a ton of snaps in the NFL because blocking is a whole different beast at the, that level. Some of the best tight ends ever had really quiet rookie seasons. Tony Gonzalez, Jason Witten, both had under 400 yards. Travis Kelsey didn't get a target until year two and played just one snap on special teams. George Kittle was a good role player in 2017, but jumped from 515 yards to over 1,300 going from year one to year two. For most tight ends, there's a huge learning curve. Offensive linemen have to fine tune their blocking. Receivers have to learn the route tree. Tight ends have to do both. When the Bears took Adam Shaheen out of Ashland University in 2017, he admitted that he had never really pass blocked until he got to an NFL minicamp. Speaking of the Bears and tight ends, they also have a very good one named Cole Komet, second round pick. One of the best first round tight ends ever, Greg Olson, also drafted by the Bears. But even he didn't go until pick 31. So the Chicago Bears know how to draft tight ends, one of the trickiest positions to evaluate, but not QB, huh. There just aren't a lot of tight ends that can do both at a great or even efficient level. And as NFL offenses move further and further into more three wide receiver sets, that means you can't hide your tight ends. More often than not, there's only one tight end on the field. So if he can't block, defenses aren't going to believe you can or will run the ball. The college game is so different, perhaps outside of Iowa, that rookie tight ends need to learn a whole different facet of the game before they can become full-time players. And a lot of them can't master blocking to the point where they can stay on the field and become dynamic targets in the passing game. The guys who are good blockers blockers in college typically do a lot of it to the point where their receiving numbers are then deflated. Kittle and Laporta, for example. But that experience gets them on the field earlier in the NFL and they get to prove that, oh yeah, I can catch the ball and run with it too. You understand me for what I am? You don't? Oh, okay. Then they have to be one of the best options in the passing game, which Laporta was for Jared Goff if Amon Ross St. Brown was covered. Ultimately, it's really fucking hard to figure out who's going to be good at both coming out of college, and that's not a new problem. The game has evolved, but the tight end lottery has not. Hall of Famer Shannon Sharp was a seventh round pick back in 1990 by the Denver Broncos. We need a National Guard. We need as many men as you can spare, because we are killing the Patriots. Ah. And a future Hall of Famer in Antonio Gates completely undrafted. That's what makes Brock Bowers so intriguing. Bowers is not going to beat Kyle Pitts as the highest drafted tight end in NFL history, but he's likely coming off the board in the top half of the first round. 
Georgia used Bowers as more of a hybrid type player than a true tight end. They used him everywhere, even as a runner, carrying the ball 19 times for 193 yards and five touchdowns in his college career. He's also a monster with the ball in his hands, leading all tight ends in yards after catch for all three years he was in school. Bowers is so good at breaking tackles that Georgia would design plays for him in space like you might do with a really good running back. As a blocker, he's been described by Daniel Jeremiah, one of the best, as someone who's an effective run blocker when he can get his hands on opponents, but he will get pressed out by longer armed edge rushers. That certainly makes sense because Bowers is just six foot three, which definitely puts him on the shorter side for tight ends in just about any draft class. I don't think there's any question about Bowers' ability as a pure playmaker. He's gotten comps to George Kittle and Greg Olson, per me, but the question is whether or not he can overcome a smaller frame and become that same kind of blocker, or simply a good enough blocker to keep him on the field and every package a team runs on offense. That's the key. Whoever takes Bowers has to have a plan for him. If the plan is backflips, then he's gonna win them the gold medal. Perfect time for Flag Football Olympics. Now the tight end position is so nuanced as we found out over the last decade that you can't just drop them next to the left or right tackle and watch them spread their wings. It has to be a specific kind of offense or at least one that's going to design packages and formations specifically for him because that's what's going to make him worth a top 15 pick in my opinion. To put it simply, other positions are more valuable when you're spending top 10 to 15 draft capital capital. Several things have to align for a tight end to make a significant impact in a game. A corner, an edge player, a tackle, a wide receiver can win individually at their positions and contribute right away. Of course, history tells us that Jatavion Sanders or Theo Johnson or Cade Stover or Ben Sanat will be the best tight ends in this class. That's how cursed the tight end position truly is. Thanks for watching a balls deep dive into tight ends here on That's Good Sports. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel and make sure you come back on draft night. We'll be live here, live streaming the draft and praying to God my team selects a quarterback.